Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Just one correction in uh, the introduction, I'm no longer at the St. Raphael campus. Uh, you can find me over at uh, the Howard Avenue um, building, our Dana Clinic building in the Center for Nutrition and Wellness. So I'm very honored to be following uh, Dr. Kelly um, because there's such a, a a correlation between nutrition and the gut microbiome. And so much of what I'm gonna be talking about today has a direct impact on our gut microbiome. And it's one of the ways that we can control um, and influence our disease outcomes. So just quickly review what um, I hope that you will take away from our talk today. Um, I hope you'll be able to identify healthy dietary pattern for preventing IBD and disease flares, state nutritional risk factors associated with IBD, and to identify foods and fluids to consume when your IBD is flaring, and to understand how to maintain nutritional status when complications arise. So we know with IBD that um, it is more common, the prevalence is much greater in the industrialized nations, um, and certainly the Western diet is playing a significant role um, in our gut microbiome. Um, and even in other areas of the world where the disease is emerging and the prevalence is growing, um, you know, we can see that those are nations that are becoming more industrialized. So what are some of the nutritional factors that may play a role in IBD risk? Um, we know from food consumption studies here in the United States and from other studies that have been done that there um, is an overall inadequate consumption of fiber and nutrients from those high fiber foods, from whole grains, fresh fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. We know that there's inadequate consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, especially leafy greens, citrus, berry, and variety and diversity overall. Um, the American public does a terrible job consuming fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the NHANES data, the um, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey has shown us that only about 10% of Americans achieves the correct amount of fresh fruits and vegetables per day. Um, and that is anywhere from two to three cups of each of those food groups daily. We know that we have an excessive consumption of red meats and in particular processed meats. And we know this because um, when we are not consuming adequate amounts of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, we're filling up our bellies with other things. And um, typically they are foods that are easy to get to, um, convenience foods, foods we can eat fast and on the run, but, but our guts do suffer from that. Excessive consumption of processed dairy products, and by that I mean dairy products that have more added oils, more added sodium, sugars, emulsifiers, and the like. Excessive consumption of refined carbohydrates. And I want to emphasize that word refined because carbohydrates are our main source of dietary fiber. So we have to learn to distinguish between the two of them. The refined carbohydrates have more added sugars, added fats, emulsifiers, preservatives, and sodium. So those are the ones that we want to be careful about. Inadequate consumption of omega-3 fatty acid rich foods that we would get from fish, nuts, and seeds, and an excessive consumption of added sugars, which may contribute to obesity. And there may be, um, obesity may be um, at play in the risk of IBD as well. I'll quickly uh, gloss over this slide because we just learned so much um, in our previous talk by Dr. Kelly. Um, but of course, getting to the crux of the matter, and that is the prebiotic benefit that we get from dietary fibers are extremely important. They are fermented by certain species in the, um, of the microbiota and the biome, which then produce these beneficial compounds, short-chain fatty acids, butyrate, that are essential for the health of um, our gut cells. And are in, beyond that as well, metabolically.
So the importance of dietary fiber is that it promotes healthy motility. Motility is the movement of a food bolus through the digestive tract, and it's influenced by both soluble fibers and insoluble fibers. Soluble fibers hold water in um, and among the other fibers um, in the stool. Insoluble fibers tend to speed up um, gut transit time. Soluble fibers tend to be slower in terms of gut transit time. They help to reduce inflammation, but very, very importantly, the foods that are rich in dietary fiber are also rich in an array of nutrients that we know are very difficult for folks with IBD to maintain adequate amounts of. Vitamin C, A, carotene, K, vitamin E, B complex, magnesium, and zinc. So it is important that we find ways to incorporate these foods in our diet. So what should I eat? What should I avoid? That's what I hear all the time. Um, so right now, what I'm talking about time, it would be a time when you are in remission, um, when you're feeling mostly well, maybe with some digestive issues. Um, but we would want, when you're not in remission, to you to know that you do not have to limit or severely restrict your diet. We want to pay attention to your diet being nutritionally balanced, very plant forward so that we get those fibers and nutrients, whole foods that are minimally processed. We want to avoid the known food uh, intolerances that may be adversely affecting our gut health. For some people, that might be lactose. Certainly, we know too much caffeine and alcohol, I should have added that in as well, can negatively um, affect uh, our gut health. So we want to choose an eating pattern. And I want to emphasize that word so much. It's about a pattern because there are not any single foods that have been shown to be causative when it comes to inflammatory bowel disease. And it's that pattern that helps to nourish us and keep us, um, keep our health and our gut health in, in check. So we know through studies um, most recently that a Mediterranean eating pattern is recommended, and that's typically what, what we recommend in our clinic as well. In two prospective studies, a greater adherence to a Mediterranean diet was associated with a significantly lower risk of later onset Crohn's disease. And the DINE study um, compared a very restrictive specific carbohydrate diet, which restricts all dairy products, um, and it takes out all grains from the diet. It's an older um, diet therapy that had been adopted um, earlier in the 20th century and compared that to the Mediterranean diet, uh, the Mediterranean eating pattern. And the results were that they were similar in helping people to feel better, less fatigue, less pain. Um, and they were also similar in achieving remission rates. However, um, and, and that was roughly in the mid 40% helping people to achieve remission uh, more quickly. The Mediterranean eating pattern um, doesn't restrict any whole food group. Um, and so therefore, there's a lower risk of developing nutritional deficiencies with the Mediterranean pattern. So what does that look like? Increased consumption of fruits and vegetables, as I said before, two to three cups of each per day. Choosing whole grains of variety with fewer additives from sugars, fats, salt. Choose legumes, nuts, seeds, lentils. Not every meal has to have animal protein, utilizing more of those plant proteins. Decreasing our consumption of red meats and um, especially processed meats, maybe only once a week or even less, choosing minimally processed um, poultry, low fat, fish, eggs, um, fish meals, at least two or more uh, meals per week, choosing calcium rich foods. Calcium and vitamin D deficiency are very common in IBD. So we wanna make sure that we are meeting those nutritional needs, but choosing the healthier types, right? So, you know, 
ice cream, milkshakes, cheesecake, processed cheeses, those are not the healthier types of dairy products that we want to include in our diet. We may need to include lactose-free dairy products, but we also want healthy fat, and this is a key part of the Mediterranean diet, olive oil, seed oil, avocado, hummus, nut, or seed butters. So it might look like this. This is our healthy plate. Um, we want to have roughly the same amount of lean protein and whole grains, and then an abundance of those fruits and vegetables. Um, and then surrounding that, complementing that in smaller amounts throughout the day, your dairy, your avocado, your nut and seed oils, certainly you're going to want to hydrate as well. But that's what your dietary um, pattern should look like on a daily basis. So I just want to say quickly, we have to be careful about what we read on the internet. Um, there was a study done um, where learners were asked to do nutritional searches on the in internet for nutrition information. And they looked at the posts that these learners um, were making, posts that they were obtaining from the internet when they were searching um, a nutrition topic. And what you should know is that um, the nutrition, the providers of the nutrition information were most commonly 34% tertiary educated indiv individuals lacking nutrition qualifications. That means the proper education, training, um, practice that goes into um, bringing all of the nutrition information together. 19% had no identifiable author information and only 5% were from nutrition professionals. So what could happen is you could do a quick nutrition search, say you type into Google um, diet and IBD. And depending upon what other things you had been searching that day, what might pop up for you might be a low FODMAP diet. It might be the specific carbohydrate diet, but that doesn't mean that's the best diet for IBD. And so that's part of the problem with using the internet. So let's try to be aware and avoid the pitfalls of falling into those traps where we are consuming overly restrictive diets. Restrictive diets um, put us at a greater risk for nutritional deficiencies. We want to, again, choose patterns where whole food groups um, are included in the pattern. A diet which restricts a whole food groups leaves out a whole group of important nutrients. Um, the development of food fears. So based on things, potentially misinformation or misinterpretation, we might think this food is bad, that food is bad, I can't eat that. And, and it's not always the case that you can't eat that. Um, so food tolerance depends greatly on you know, whether you're flaring or not, um, whether you're in remission, portion size, food pairing. Um, and just be aware that supplement producers and advertisers will prey and profit from our fears and nutritional concerns. So we do have a potential for micronutrient deficiencies. Um, I mentioned a bunch of these to you already. Um, and, you know, the foods that they are in could potentially be the foods that you might be restricting from your diet. Risk of protein, energy, malnutrition. Um, again, these are all pretty obvious, uh, low body weight, restrictive eating, the symptoms associated with flaring. The indicators are, you know, when we've lost weight, when we already have a low body mass index, um, where we have a diet history or a sustained inadequate food and fluid intake. And we also can do the assessment by looking at your, your lab values and other inflammatory markers. So you're having a flare and the symptoms are very troublesome. We still want to keep in mind that healthy plate, um, but we want to move especially toward lean proteins, probably lactose-free dairy, because anytime there's inflammation in the gut, we do not digest lactose well, because the enzymes to do that are in the lining of the small intestine and, and during inflammation, we might lose um, the expression of those enzymes. We're going to want soft cooked vegetables, soft fruits. We're probably going to want to 
just have the pulp of them and not the skin because too much fiber, especially too much insoluble fiber, can be problematic when you're flaring. So want to focus on the soluble fibers, oats, potato, peeled apricots and apples, orange, mango, things like that. Whole grain breads, but no more than about two grams of fiber. Utilizing refined rice and pasta. There's no significant evidence that avoiding gluten or wheat is going to be making a difference in your outcomes. Although I do recognize that there can be other intolerances associated with wheat. Um, based on your history. Small amounts of plant-based fats that we talked about before. Foods to limit, lactose, dairy fat, caffeine, alcohol, greasy fried food, large portions. So you're gonna wanna do smaller, more frequent meals and snacks, the raw fruits and vegetables, fiber, and go, e go easy on those empty calories because you don't wanna fill up on those and then not be able to get your fruits and vegetables and other nutritious foods in. Hydrate. Um, 64 to 80 ounces of fluids per day, depending on your size, mostly water, no caffeine, limit sugar. Um, broths can be very helpful and very important, especially if you're having a lot of nausea and vomiting. When we are vomiting, we tend to lose more sodium. We definitely want to include those lactose-free milks and supplements, especially if we're not able to get enough calories from solid foods. Um, and then if necessary, using oral rehydration therapy. These are just some of the products that we've recommended and our folks have used before. The oral rehydration therapy better than Gatorade because it has the right balance um, between um, sugars uh, and the various types of electrolytes, which enhance absorption of the water and the electrolytes. Troubleshooting with strictures, we definitely need to lower fiber intake. Um, you may need to be on a, a full liquid diet if it's very bad or sometimes um, leading up to surgery. But you do want to still be careful to include those plant-based foods, the cooked fruits, vegetables, low fiber starches. Um, water, hydrating well to prevent constipation if you have a stricture, blended fruits and vegetables in smoothies and especially soups because the soups can cook those vegetables for you. And then again, utilizing those oral um, liquid nutritional products. And for ostomies, one of the most important thing for ostomies, um, of course, hydrating um, well, but it, you know, slowing down the transit time through the small intestine can increase the absorption of nutrients, especially those micronutrients. So if we pair uh, those carbohydrate foods with protein and healthy fats in smaller meals throughout the day, you're um, going to have more success in um, maintaining good nutritional status. And then, you know, potentially avoiding the gas producing vegetables as needed. So when should I supplement my intake? So for a daily nutrient um, routine, I would say um, important to make sure you're getting enough vitamin D and calcium. If you're not getting three servings of calcium rich foods per day, I would recommend a daily calcium and vitamin D supplement. And I would also recommend a daily multivitamin mineral with iron supplement daily. Um, in addition to that, your provider most likely will be doing some screening of various nutrients in your blood and would recommend supplements as needed. For macronutrients, that's your calories, your protein, carbs, and fats. Um, of course, you're going to need to do that when you're unable to eat enough food. Um, if you have short gut, if you are recovering from surgery, and you've also had a noticeable loss of weight, particularly lean body mass and muscle mass, that's the time where it's very important to supplement your intake. We can use both plant-based protein powders or whey and casein. Items that have whey and casein in them do not necessarily have lactose in them. And so it is safe to use those products as a supplement. We can use medium chain triglycerides, which are a more easily absorbable form of fat, um, especially if you have short gut syndrome. Um, and again, with the oral nutrition supplements, you could use a traditional something, you know, like a store brand um, version of Ensure, Boost, NutriSure. There's all types of different um, products. You could use plant-based. 
Um, there are various plant-based um, oral liquid nutritional supplements now on the market as well. You could choose clear or creamy. So there's lots of options available to us. Um, so bringing it back, um, we really want to emphasize variety, diversity, whole foods, plant-based, um, and really focusing on balance and pattern. Um, and so I hope I kept it in the time, but <laughs> and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.